Good morning. Welcome to the webinar series on managing drought in the Southern Plains. I'm Mark Taper of the Southern Climate Impacts Planning Program. I will be the moderator for today's webinar. Rachel Riley, Skip Associate Program Manager, is managing the webinar. Today's webinar is a shortened version to provide an update on the current drought status and outlook. Our extended webinars that include a focus topic will be held on the second Thursday of each month, with those, these shortened briefings on the fourth Thursday. Mark Svoboda, Monitoring Program Area Leader for the National Drought Mitigation Center and one of the U.S. Drought Monitor authors will be presenting the update. We have several state climatologists on the call as well in case there are questions related to specific areas within our region. The webinar should last about 20 to 30 minutes. This is part of an ongoing series made possible through the support of several organizations including the National Drought Mitigation Center, National Integrated Drought Information System, and NOAA Regional Climate Services Director for the Southern Region. We also greatly appreciate those of you who join us in the webinar series and recognize the valuable time that you commit to participating. You will now see on your screen a list of topics for future webinars. Cole will pop up here. The topic for the next webinar, March 8th, will be the U.S. Drought Monitor. The webinar will discuss how it is created, how it is used, and how you can be involved to assure that it accurately depicts conditions in your areas. We will tentatively, we have tentatively identified environmental impacts as a topic for the April 12th webinar based on previous polls and we're working on lining up presenters. But in case we have difficulties, uh, please feel free to uh, vote for any of the topics that you think are, uh, are most critical. These webinars are designed to improve communication across the region to help those agencies and organizations that are managing aspects of drought. Your interests and needs are important to us. We encourage you to help us select presentation topics, either through the online poll that you see on your screen, through the chat box, or by emailing or calling Skip. We welcome suggestions on presenters as well as topics. You may ask questions or make comments at any time through typing in your chat box. We will address questions at the end of the presentation. Each webinar is recorded and posted on the Skip YouTube channel. The PowerPoint slides are also posted on the NIDIS drought portal, drought.gov, in the Southern Plain section. We will put up a list of resources, including these links again at the end of the presentation. Before beginning the presentation, I would like to briefly mention a series of meetings related to the establishment of the new South Central Climate Sciences Center. The Climate Science Center is one of eight regional centers established by the U.S. Department of Interior. The South Central CSC is located at the University of Oklahoma in a consortium that includes Texas Tech University, Oklahoma State University, Louisiana State University, the Chickasaw Nation, the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, and NOAA's Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory. The centers are designed to better integrate the best available climate science with on-the-ground management practices for critical habitats and landscapes. A key partnership is the nation's 22 landscape conservation cooperatives, of which several are intersect in the region, uh, which includes Oklahoma, Texas, and New Mexico, and parts of uh, Louisiana. The, the rollout meetings we have set up uh, are going to be held regionally so that uh, we can hopefully interact with many of you at, at these uh, meetings. And we'll, at these meetings, we'll provide an overview of what the Climate Science Center is and its goals and priorities, and we'll engage in a conversation about uh, the kinds of topics that we should be addressing that are most critical to you. It, we have several dates uh, tentatively scheduled, several dates and locations. The first will be March 7th here in Norman, followed by uh, Lubbock on March 19th, and then several others into April. We are tentatively planning additional meetings as needed beyond that, but uh, hopefully these will get across the region and give people a chance to participate. I invite you to contact us through uh, the South Central southcentralclimate.org website that you see listed there. And we can, uh, you can also send us uh, email through Skip if you have any questions and we'll get it to the, uh, to the appropriate. I should mention that the March 7th date in Norman is confirmed. And uh, so, so the first one, please uh, sign up so that we can uh, be prepared for, for hosting you. So uh, I will now turn it over to Mark Svoboda for an update on drought conditions and outlooks. 
All right, thank you, Mark. Good morning, everybody. We're going to take a different tack today, and uh, this will be the main focus of this call, which hopefully will allow for some time afterward to answer any more in-depth questions you have. Uh, uh, not to let the cat out of the bag too early here, but as Mark said, the next uh, full webinar uh, will include a more extensive in-depth look at how we actually make a drop monitor, but that shouldn't preclude anyone today from asking questions, so uh, feel free to fire away later on. Okay, if we look at the first slide, of course, we're looking at the big picture here for drought across the United States. Um, you'll see the real spotty nature of the map uh, with regards to the Southern Plains. You'll also notice that we've had sort of this dual epicenter of drought occurring not only in the Southern Plains, but also in the Southeastern United States, centered over, say, Georgia, Eastern Alabama, and Northern Florida. And what we had seen uh, until the recent uh, bout of storms was sort of a trying to reconnect the bridge between those two areas along the Gulf Coast states is a, basically uh, a major reason for that was the lack of hurricane activity the last two summers, which have, has allowed this region sort of to go dry on us. So anyway, we've got that as our current situation. If we zoom down to the regional view uh, with the next slide, uh, kind of looking at this region in more detail. I think, again, um, if you were on the last uh, webinar, you, you heard Brian talk about, uh, Brian Fuchs here at the center talk about, I think the key area to focus on is in the D3 and D4 column, just the difference in the last three months. So if we look at a reduction from, say, three months ago of 64% of this entire region in extreme drought or worse, we've cut that in half down now to about 32%. And D4 has dropped all the way from 38% down to about 12% or so. So we've seen, we still have a lot of drought in the region overall. We still have 70%, 71% nearly, but even that's down 20% from where we were just three months ago. And this was quite unexpected given, again, the La Nina uh, uh, that had developed in the uh, equatorial Pacific. Uh, last year it was sort of the southeast that saw uh, uh, sort of the opposite effect due to some other reasons. Uh, that brought them more rain than was expected, or cooler weather at least. And this winter, fortunately, uh, I think we'd be sitting in a lot worse situation if that La Nina had perhaps been stronger and brought us last winter's results, which has helped got you to where you are today in this fix that we're looking at. Okay, next slide. So this kind of puts what I was trying to describe verbally into a picture. And, and pay attention, I guess, to the bottom two graphics, starting with the one on the bottom left, calendar year, you can see there anywhere from two to three class improvement according to the drought monitor across uh, a good chunk of Texas. Louisiana in particular has benefited a lot from the recent uh, uh, weather of, this, of the new year. Um, and then if you look at the, the bottom right graphic, which takes us back a little farther to the start of what we call the water year, which begins uh, on October 1st, you can see there anywhere from three to five class category improvement uh, uh, particularly uh, worth noting there is the, the large areas of improvement in southern Oklahoma uh, and as parts of south central Kansas, parts of New Mexico, so really uh, Arkansas, really region-wide uh, for the group that we're talking and targeting here today on this webinar. So this is a nice view of across most of the time periods, in fact all of the time periods on this graphic, all six of those show improvement anywhere from the last week to the last uh, six months or so. Next slide. So where do we go from here? Well, it looks like it will dry out a little bit in this region over the next five days. Uh, I guess more of the central plains is looking for maybe some abnormal warmth, whereas the southern plains, uh, extreme southern Texas, might expect to see some cooler weather. But precipitation-wise, pretty dry for all except, uh, say, the eastern Gulf Coast state region. Uh, that would affect this region and, and, and the drought monitor specifically and how that might be depicted next week. So if we go to the next slide and look out a little farther out into the future at the, at the 8 to 14 day sort of time frame, this takes us out to the first full week of March. And here they're calling for again uh, greater odds or greater likelihood of falling in into the warmer type of uh, temperatures over that time frame and a little bit split on the uh, precipitation where uh, more New Mexico and the western uh, Texas, maybe the Panhandle, might expect to see uh, drier weather along with, say, western Oklahoma. And perhaps we'll still see some favorable 
odds of precipitation occurring over eastern Texas into Louisiana and Arkansas uh, that may uh, hopefully come true out there over, say, uh, the first week of March. The next slide will go out even farther to March through May. Again, this forecast now uh, is a little bit dated. They'll, they'll be coming out with a new one here in a week or so, but this was as of February 16th, so just under a week ago or so, um, or about a week ago exactly, I should say. Here for March, you can see in the top graphic, uh, greater odds, uh, greater likelihood, enhanced chances, uh, however you want to spin that, uh, above normal temperatures. And uh, precipitation, again, here uh, we had seen a pattern where they were calling for persistently below, enhanced chances for below precipitation, which I think was directly due to not only statistical trends, but also that La Nina, which is now starting to wane out. We're starting to see that as you go down into the March through May period in the bottom graphic, where uh, the temperature signal is still there pretty strongly, in fact, where the likelihood is stronger to fall into warmer temperatures in that March through May, May period. Uh, the precipitation, not quite as much. Uh, there are a little stronger emphasis or greater odds are, are found across, say, Florida and parts of, uh, say, western New Mexico and Arizona. So that's where it tends to look the driest over that period. So maybe we're easing off a little bit on Texas here going into uh, spring, early summer. Next slide. So what does that mean for the long term? Of course, uh, one of the things we look for is we have this back-to-back -back La Nina winter. Typically, if you look at historically when we've had what they call back-to-back-to-back uh, -to -back -to -back, or these triple headers, if you will, I know Klaus Walter likes to call them triple delights. These are not good news if that were to really happen uh, across a good deal of the U.S. midsection. Really, really becomes a stronger signature for a reintensification of drought if you just look at the historical numbers. Um, having said that, though, when you look at this this uh, the spaghetti diagram or plume, if you will, of all the different models and what they're projecting out with the black dot, this is a little dated as of January 12. The new one will come out here at the end of the month. Uh, just in a few days, but you can see most of these were trending anywhere between plus or minus 5 degrees C, which is pretty much near normal, until we get uh, to around a half a degree to a degree warmer or colder, you're not going to be talking uh, El Nino or La Nina. So most of these right now are kind of putting us into that neutral, that neutral sort of signal uh, come early next fall. So that's one thing to keep an eye on is, is this, where do we go with this? Uh, as La Nina wanes off here in the spring, we go into summer sort of neutral-ish, what, what pattern will emerge next fall and winter? And the second big key to the drought busting of this region will be, will that lead to an increased chance for any sort of hurricane activity or tropical storm activity? We hope for that to be the rain side of that, certainly not the, the destruction side of the hurricanes. But really, the absence of these storms the last two uh, summers in general, we've had, you know, just a tropical storm or two combined for the two summers, very quiet. Um, that's what's helped get us in the situation of the Gulf Coast, and that's what can help get us out of it. Next slide. So the seasonal drought outlook that's issued by the Climate Prediction Center is showing a mixed bag. They're showing for quite a bit of development in the southwestern Four Corners region, and they're also calling for development in the mid-Atlantic and, and uh, southeastern United States into Florida. Uh, it's a little bit more of a mixed bag. Uh, they're showing some sort of uh, drought ongoing, but improvement. That's reflective, I think, of this week's map already uh, as they were looking at what was going to occur over the next two weeks when this first came out. That's incorporated into the seasonal outlook. And I think that's why you're seeing the strife nature in eastern Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi. That's what we just saw. So going forward, it looked a little drier, a little quieter. Um, and then we saw that also in eastern Kansas and Oklahoma. So that's really more of a reflection of the current situation. We have seen some rebounding of stream flows in eastern Oklahoma. We've seen some rebound in some of the reservoirs, but not a total recharge of, of uh, groundwater or anything of that nature quite yet. We'd like to see some more. Next slide. So I'll finish and, and kind of touch on a key, uh, key set of products sort of, again, sort of letting the cat out of the bag early. These are two of the products that do go into the making of the drop monitor, uh, what we call the objective blends. And we have a short-term blend and a long-term blend. 
and I'll show you those in a minute, but basically in rough, just to give a rough generalization of the cutoff there, at least time scale wise, short term we're generally looking at seasonal three months, maximum of six months or less. When we talk long term hydrological type of impacts, we're starting to talk about even greater than six months. So that's sort of our our time frame. And when you look at these maps, we're, we're trying to effort hard to take these to a gridded basis um, and include new inputs and different weighting schemes. So these, these blends came out all the way back in 2000 uh, through a lot of trial and error and uh, sort of vetted those for about an 18 month to 24 month period before we, even, before we even felt comfortable using those. So I think the new generation of these blends will take that sort of time uh, to get comfortable with those, but I think they will be an enhancement when they come down the pipe. Next slide shows the short term blend. Things to pay attention to here, again, keeping in mind generally three months or less, six months or less. On the left, there's a little table on the bottom left that shows you what inputs are going into this blend for each of these uh, blocks on the map. And those are called climate divisions. And so it's a pretty core scale depiction of, of, of a combination of those indicators. And when the drought monitor first came out, the web was just sort of starting to, to burgeon up and we just didn't have a whole lot that we could get our hands on that was reliable, operational every week. But what was available was available at the climate division scale, and that's really changed now. So I think we're a little antiquated now, but these are still useful in some ways. When I look at the map for next week, I'll look at the short-term blend and go, is there any area on the short-term map that's showing uh, drought that I don't show on the drought monitor, and why is that? Why not? Should I be? Um, so we've got these parameters. Again, noticing those uh, one-month and three-month precipitation are actually... FPI, so it's kind of misleading, but those are actually FPI. And what we're looking at there is a weighting scheme uh, predominantly with outside of 90 days as a small weight. So most of this is geared towards 90 days or less. Now, going to the long-term picture, it's gonna look a lot different. Here we can see, well, yeah, we've had some short-term recovery, but over the long-term, we still have some ground to make up. So. That's always tough when you're coming out of drought. First of all, how to show it, when to uh, call the wolves off, uh, our groundwater storage, uh, surface storage, is that all rebounded? So there's a lag going into drought, but there's also this lag coming out. Looking at the parameters we look at, now we're talking everything at six months and out. And we have more, more parameters that we look at compared to the short term. Again, we had more at our disposal. Um, it doesn't affect much in this region, but it does affect western Texas and New Mexico and, and uh, parts of uh, western Kansas and, and southeastern Colorado. You'll notice there's sort of a, a, an outline there in the, sort of that fuchsia color. There's a different set of criteria we use for the west that are geared much more towards that longer term because of the managed system out there uh, for the most part. And the longer uh, response times to drought going in and coming out more of a sort of a hydrological vent to it. So it's a little different weighting scheme. We got that from input from folks in the West. We worked with a lot of the regional climate centers and state climatologists, and then kind of did that by trial and error for a couple years too before we were comfortable with that. So the bottom line here, short term, we've seen, if you go back one, one slide, let's look at that slide again, pretty good improvement until you get over to the Southeast Mid-Atlantic, and if you go back to the long term, still pretty pervasive drought uh, sort of laying underneath that, if you will. Okay, next slide. So next time, March 8th, I believe Mark Schaefer touched on, there will be a more extensive overview looking at, I think what you'll notice from these blends and that talk will be the amount of detail at the station or gridded basis, high resolution, high temporal frequency that we can now ingest into the drop monitor every week. So we've really increased our capacity to respond to drought at that county, sub-county level, which when we first started, I don't believe was there in the first three to five years. And with that, we'll open it up for any questions. My contact information should be on the next slide. All right, there we go. Mark Schaefer, back to you. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, there's, uh, we're looking at a chat box and, uh, and, and uh, don't see any questions yet, but uh, I'd like to, um, I'd like to thank Mark for uh, doing another briefing here, and, and the, uh, Mark and Brian at the Drought Mitigation Center have been fabulous throughout all these 
webinars going back to last uh, last year. Every couple of weeks, they're they're putting this together, so I very much appreciate it. Um, for uh, for anybody able, we invite you to stay on the line if to continue conversations. If you have any questions or want uh, additional detail from Mark or uh, any of our state climatologists on the line, um, please uh, type in there. Um, I know that Mary Knapp is on with us from Kansas, and Renee McPherson is from Oklahoma. And uh, uh, as a reminder, the webinar recording will be posted to the SKIP YouTube page. And our uh, next webinar will be on March 8th with a focus on the U.S. Drought Monitor. Uh, as always, we encourage you to continue to spread the word to make sure all those dealing with aspects of this drought are part of the larger community and can access the support they need. Uh, thank you for your time today. And we look forward to continuing this conversation with you in the future and appreciate any kind of guidance you can provide to us on the topics that you'd like to see on these. So uh, since I don't see any questions, I guess we'll, we'll end it there and appreciate your time and, and attention.